Hello and thank you for joining us as we take a closer look at the precious metals market alongside leading industry insiders. We're joined today by Professor Kevin Dowd of Durham University to discuss banking regulations, stress tests and the Austrian School of Economics. So today I'm with uh, Professor Kevin Dowd of uh, Durham University. He's a professor of economics there. He's also a fellow of the senior fellow of the Adam Smith Institute, the Cobden Center for Honest Money and Social Progress, the American Institute for Economic Research. He's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, as well as a member of the academic advisory board of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Now, Kevin, that's quite a, an impressive CV. I, could, I was wondering if you could explain um, your role in some of these institutions. Well, basically, uh, John, what I, I do is occasionally I do policy pieces for them um, and, you know, a regular number of blogs just to keep up to date with different policy um, policy questions. So the areas I cover are things like uh, financial regulation, central bank, gold standard. Um, I, I take a view that's, uh, let's say, unconventional. So I, I don't subscribe to the, the Keynesian sort of conventional wisdom that's dominated macroeconomics since the 1930s. But I'm much more sympathetic to, you could say, uh, Austrian school of economics or, or more generally to pro-free market um, uh, positions. And all of those institutes are essentially pro-free market. Wow. Well, we've heard Austrian economics uh, quite a lot. I think over the last sort of 10, 12 years, at least since the, uh, the last financial crisis, could you explain what Austrian economics is and why some of our customers who, as we're in the gold industry, why they might be in, in, interested in Austrian economics? Okay, so Austrian economics evolved in the late uh, 19th century. Um, its leading thinkers were actually Austrians. So there was Karl Menger, Friedrich Hayek, um, Ludwig von Mises. Um, and these, now, the school of thought has kind of evolved. So, so we could think of what we now call macroeconomics as having split apart in the 20s and 30s. So one, one part of it went off into macroeconomics, which is all about demand management and the central bank fiddling around with the economy. And the Austrians tend to be much more skeptical of that. We tend to be much more in favor of constrained uh, policy, um, very averse to interest rate tinkering by a central bank, um, much more sympathetic to gold. Um, and some of us are against central banking anyway. We believe in um, private money, uh, a, a banking system with no central bank and no financial regulator either. Okay. So how, how do you say that differs from, like you said, the more mainstream Keynesian schools? Well, okay, so first off, Keynes promotes a demand management um, as, as the central sort of macroeconomic policy plank. We think that you shouldn't do that. You should allow the economy essentially to self-adjust. So you, you don't want to manage it, management of the economy. The economy is like a spontaneous order. It, it, it corrects itself. Um, you don't want some uh, guardian, like a central bank, uh, trying to manage something that's essentially a spontaneous order that doesn't need being m meddled with by some central banker who imagines that they have more wisdom and more understanding of the economy than they actually have. This is, a fundam this is the fundamental philosophical position. Um, and we would further argue that the history of meddling is one of repeated disasters. And the more, the more powers these people take to themselves, the bigger the mess they make of it. Um, and we see this especially in the, um, the run-up to the global financial crisis and in the mishandling of the aftermath of the financial crisis, where the central banks have, have, have really resorted to more and more extraordinarily uh, unwise policies, you know, zero interest rate policy, they now talk about negative, printing money like crazy, uh, quantitative easing, which essentially means uh, the central bank is uh, driving credit spreads and so forth and, and uh, getting into credit allocation policy, which should be left to the market. So there's lots wrong with uh, what's happened. And then you've got all the problems related to, uh, let's say, financial regulation, uh, including like stress testing and so on, some of the main uh, 
innovative features of post-crisis policy are essentially all very, very fundamentally mistaken. And last point on this, the central banks have essentially uh, painted themselves into a corner with uh, low interest rate policies that to restore normality, we need much higher interest rates. If you raise interest rates, you'll crash the system. That's that's predictable response of a, of a very unwise policy that was adopted essentially in 2009. Right. Interesting. Well, I mean, you, you, you speak about banking regulations. We've seen quite a few instances in the last few months, at least, of uh, practice of financial spoofing. So, uh, um, you know, uh, traders have tried to manipulate the gold price and basically just general misbehavior and misconduct within the financial industry. I was wondering, how haven't the regulations helped to curb some of this financial I think it, I think they may have. They, they may have made a small difference, but they haven't addressed the fundamental issues. So I would say, first off, that traders have always been uh, into these sort of uh, games, you know, front-running orders and so forth. It's as old as the hills. Um, the question is whether you should outlaw it or whether you should allow... Um, the firms to manage these problems themselves. The old banking system, let's say, that ended more or less in the 1970s in this country, uh, had a kind of ethos that this was known to happen, but firms' reputations suffered if they were in too indulgent. So, so uh, it was a kind of frowned upon activity, but which was managed to some extent by the banks themselves, and it wasn't criminalised. Now, what modern financial regulation tends to do is to supplant these kind of, let's say, market uh, responses to these problems with something much heavier, which might work on paper, but often doesn't. So let's just say they may have made some improvements, but nothing much more than tinkering, in my opinion. I think what we, we need is much more radical thinking and much more fundamental reform than what we've had. Okay. Do, 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 do you think there's perhaps more sort of uh, misconduct that, than we're actually hearing about? Well, there's, there's no question of that. Um, what, you know, this sort of theory that if you see a cockroach, you've only seen the one, you can safely assume that there are many more that you haven't seen. <laughs> that, that's the, the starting point. And so often, you, you, you know, we'll, you'll have a bank that says, you know, we've got our act cleaned, um, uh, like Deutsch has done this and many others. And then later on, you find out that that was all complete hogwash. If you've been unwise enough to listen to the bank's reassurances, you would have been fooled over and over again. So there's no question that there's a lot more of this stuff lurking uh, in behind. And yet we, um, we're we only aware of perhaps the tip of the iceberg. And let me give you another a concrete example is Wirecard. You know, the FT, to its credit, pursued Wirecard and Baffin, the German regulator, went after the FT. Um, there were people were hiring, uh, uh, you know, whistleblowers were, were being chased in the store, being followed in the street by detectives to were looking for dirt to blackmail them with. But the FT stuck its ground and it turned out the FT was spot on right. The whole thing was a fraud and the regulators in Germany were part of the problem. Now, that to me is archetypal case, but there's probably a hundred of these out there that we haven't yet really got to grips with. You have to bear in mind, too, that the low interest rate policies allow zombie institutions to carry on that would have been eliminated in a central market-based system a long time ago. So when, when institutions are underwater, um, the, the, the tendency for bad behaviour and the incentives for bad behaviour are much, much worse. Um, I could go on at great length about that, but there's no question that there's a lot of this stuff still inside the banks. And I can see evidence indirectly of this when you look at things like the, um, the price-to-book ratios of the banks, which are, for the UK banks, about 36%. A healthy banking system, the price-to-book ratio is well over 100%. So that means that the markets don't believe the numbers that the banks are reporting in their financial statements. Um, so there you know that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bank of England, by the way, we've, some of us have haggled with the bank for years. The bank comes up with innovative ways to evade the, the issue, but the price-to-book ratio cannot be evaded. 
it's telling you rock solid that there are problems. You don't know whether the problems are uh, low, you know, carried forward losses from the great financial crisis, which I think some of it is, or whether the profitability of the banks is extremely low. That's also a problem. The Bank of England's done nothing to fix this problem. All it's done is window dress it. Right. Well, I, I think for a lot of people, I think um, you ask the the, uh, the man in the street, they'll they'll probably want more regulation in the uh, financial sector. If we were to adopt a more free market banking system, what would be in place? What incentives would there be for big big financial uh, institutions to? self-regulate and prevent such problems? Okay, let me give you a couple of examples. Number one, in my kind of preferred system, we'd be on a gold standard, something similar. Now, the gold standard imposes restrictions against the over-issue of currency. So if a, if a bank issues too much currency, the public will just return it to the bank of issue and say, right, give us, give us our gold back or whatever it is. So with the fiat system that we've had since 1971, when the link to gold was cut, there was no longer that market-based constraint on the amount of currency in circulation. A central bank can print as much of it as it wants, and it does. So that's the first thing. But secondly, a lot of uh, financial regulation creates very unhealthy incentives um, towards uh, excessive risk-taking by the banks. So let me give you just one example of that. Um, it's what I call the, the bankster social contract, which we're all familiar with, you know, which is uh, privatised gains for the banks and socialised losses. So the banks like to, if they can, run down their, um, th their capital to maximise rate of return on equity. That, that's great for the banks in the good times when they make really good profits, which they can then distribute to themselves. And when things go terribly wrong, which we saw in the global financial crisis, they get bailed out by the taxpayer. So it's privatised gains, socialised losses. That's the banks to social contract. Now, in, a, in the market-based system that I would uh, propose, uh, there would be no central bank to bail the banks out. And if, the bank, if, if you get cowboy banks that, that run themselves uh, into the ground, they would simply fail. And, and this is what you saw in instances of historical free banking before central banks became dominant across the world. So, for example, Scottish free banking, Canadian free banking in the 19th century and so on. These systems were much more stable because the incentives, to, um, they had much better handle on how to manage the incentives towards excessive risk taking, which are now kind of rampant throughout the uh, throughout the world really, certainly among the Western countries. Right. Deposit insurance, sorry, deposit insurance is another example. You see, be, and before deposit insurance, uh, d uh, people who deposited their money with banks were much more careful about monitoring their banks. Then, then along came the idea that, you know, and what happened if a bank was careless, it faced a run, was run out of business. So people got this idea that runs were bad, right? So you think of, um, you know, these Mary Poppins, you know, where, where there's a bank run and so on. So we want to eliminate bank runs, or so people said. So we institute deposit insurance so people don't feel the need to run on the bank. I would say bank runs are just great because you need them to eliminate the bad banks. You want the bankers to be frightened of of their customers, of you know, their depositors, to some extent their shareholders, so that they will, be, they will behave themselves, you see. And now study after study has looked at the impact of deposit insurance on banking instability, and the answer is it makes banks more unstable than they would be, you see. So the intuition is totally different. The, 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 the modern thinking is that bank runs are bad, so we stop the bank run by depositing by deposit insurance. That's completely the wrong way around. You, you, by stopping the bank run, you, you're preventing a natural mechanism that weeds out the bad banks and gives the bad banks incentives not to be bad banks. You see, so deposit insurance creates a, a race to the bottom. And what I want is a race to the top. <laughs> That's an interesting perspective. I don't think uh, a lot of people would be uh, aware of that kind of, uh, of that kind of thought, but it, it, it sounds 
you know, it, it does sound a lot different to what we hear usually from, you know, just straightforward, increase the regulations, stop these things from happening. But for whatever bit. reason, they still do. <laughs> yeah, true enough, yeah. And when I first heard about this, this argument, I thought it's bonkers. And then after a while, I thought about it, I thought, no, 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 the, the anti-deposit insurance people are clearly right. I've stuck with that ever since. Well, moving on to central banking, which I'm aware you've done quite a lot of work on, I think the, the hot topic at the moment is negative interest rates. Are we going to move into them? Are we not? Um, it seems fairly controversial among many economists. Um, what, are your banks con- what, what are your opinions of the bank's considerations? and What's the likely outcome of such a policy? Okay, well, it's clearly the case that negative interest rates are on the agenda as a policy tool. Now, let me just say first off that the central bank should not be manipulating interest rates on a, under a gold standard. It wouldn't exist to manipulate them in the... Well, it, if the gold standard had no central bank, it wouldn't exist to manipulate central uh, to manipulate interest rates. If you have a, a central bank on a gold standard, it has very limited uh, means to manipulate central banks. So we're talking about a very extreme form of intervention to meddle with the most fundamental price in the whole system, which is the interest rate. Now, now, since in the financial crisis, they reduced interest rates to nearly zero, and that has not worked. It's destroyed the profitability of the banks. So let's just then imagine that if we reduce interest rates and take them into negative territory, it's going to further erode the bank's profitability. It's the last thing you want to do to make the banks profitable again. Now, secondly, the proponents of negative interest rates imagine that by reducing interest rates, they are stimulating the economy. Okay. But once interest rates become negative, then essentially those negative interest rates are taxes on deposits. They're exactly equivalent to that. So a tax is never stimulative. You see, so, so when you cross that boundary, uh, the policies are not only you're going to destroy the profitability, what little profitability the banks have, but you're not going to stimulate the economy either. So that this is not being thought through. And what you then get is into the danger of a, of a spiral where they reduce interest rates to minus 2% and it doesn't work. So they reduce them to minus 5% or minus 10%. We just have a a very deflationary spiral, which is the last thing that Keynesian economists um, ever want to see, but they're actually creating it by their own fault. <laughs> but it gets worse than that because you know, if, if imagine the central bank says, well, we'll knock interest rates to minus 2%. How do you think the public are going to react? Well, they'll flee to cash. You see, so we'll all go in and say, I'm going to take my deposits out of the bank and I'm going to stuff them in the mattress or wherever it is. And that's it, because you get a better return with zero, which is what cash gives you, the negative uh, 2%, which is what the banks give you. So what will the policymakers do? They'll abolish cash. You see, they have to abolish cash to implement negative rates. But abolishing cash would be a catastrophic policy for all sorts of reasons. Um, imagine people who are just beggars on the street when they don't have a fancy mobile phone. They're hanging on the edges of a, of a monetary economy. And, and there are a lot of people in, in living in conditions of extreme poverty or ex, um, who really this would be a very cruel thing to do to them. Um, but also there's the kind of, let's say, the... the, the, the uh, Let's say, what kind of society do we want to live in where, where if you have um, everybody using digital currency, then the, the government can follow everything that you're doing and they can start to control your lives, your lives, our lives in the most intimate ways. So they decide, they take one look at you and say, well, you're too fat, so we're not going to allow you to, uh, we'll put some automatic blocks so you can't buy uh, crisps or you drink too much, so we'll, we'll control that. So you then become completely in hot to health fascists, right, with some weird agenda. And you have no, no way of escaping from this. So you're into this kind of nightmare scenario, you know, Will Smith world where, where you can be just destroyed. You can be 
digitally outlawed or completely controlled at the will of somebody that, who has basically absolute power. It's, it's an absolutely dystopian nightmare. And I just would have thought it was obvious that we don't want to go down that route. Wow. Well, I mean, sticking with the, the, the central banks, um, you've done a lot of research into the Bank of England stress tests um, over the years. Um, back in only last year, uh, the central bank, they said that the UK banks were resilient to deep simultaneous recessions in the UK and global economies. Now, 12 months later, it seems a, as though we've sort of hit that, that mark. So what, what were your findings from the stress tests? Well, let me answer that in a minute. The first thing to appreciate is what a stress test is. It's a hypothetical scenario based on a bunch of models calibrated by people, quantitative quants inside the central bank. We're not talking facts here. If you want to get facts, you should be talking about um, reforms like uh, how do we uh, improve our um, accounting standards so that the information reported to investors is as accurate as possible. So the investors can decide whether the banks are um, sound or not or whatever. So essentially stress tests come along and they are make-believe exercises to provide reassurance to the public which really isn't necessary if they just got the accounts right. Now then, okay, so that's your starting point. But the central bank has an agenda and that agenda involves promoting confidence in the banking system. So then we run into the first big problem with the stress tests. Suppose the Bank of England did an honest uh, stress test and said the banking system was completely up the creek. Are they going to reveal that? Well, of course they're not. So therefore, they have to have a situation where the banks always, essentially the banking system always passes the stress test. Because if it didn't and the bank admitted it, then the bank would have to admit, the central bank would have to admit that it's completely got its policies wrong ever since and before the financial crisis. So when, when they say we've done this rigorous stress test and everything's just fine, it's like communist, you know, the North Korea saying, you know, we've had a free and fair election and 120%, we had 120% voter turnout in favor <laughs> of the party. You see, so it lacks credibility right from the word go. So then the kind of looking at specifics of the stress test, what we find are things like um, very poor modeling, uh, that you have this doomsday scenario and yet the banks magically come out in good shape. Scenario that's much worse than the global financial crisis and yet the banks suffer a fraction of the losses. And you think, hold on, there's something funny going on here. And when we look into it, what we find is that the, the link from the macro economy to the losses, the feedback link from the macro economy stress to the losses on the banks is extremely weak. Then we find things like uh, they're using the wrong metrics. They're using gameable metrics that the banks can fiddle. So they use uh, CET1 ratio, which is the ratio of capital to risk-weighted assets. But the risk-weighted assets measure is completely gamed to the hilt by the bank. So it's the wrong metric. They use book values instead of market values for capital measures. So this alludes to the price-to-book problem I mentioned earlier. The, the past standards of the test are very, very low. And, and there's also more subtle problems like the kind of um, this idea of macro prudential policy, which kind of implies that the Bank, the bank of England can somehow uh, gauge where the economy is in the financial cycle or even see into the future in a way that it cannot possibly do. Now, this is a key Austrian theme, which is that policymakers tend to imagine that they have more information and that they are wiser than they actually are. And because we don't believe that, we'd rather sort of disperse responsibility across the economy. And that's just one reason for being pro-market and anti-monopoly, you know, trusting some monopoly institution, which essentially screws up again and again and again. And we also have to look at the, the run-up to the financial crisis. So, so in 2007, uh, the bank was saying everything's just fine, the tripartite system was just fantastic. And then uh, it took three years before Mervyn King acknowledged that there was a capital adequacy problem 
because previous to that, the bank's position was it was a, a, a mere liquidity problem which can easily be handled. So they misdiagnosed the crisis. They could even three years after the start of the crisis, that they they woke up to recognise what everybody else had more or less worked out. Um, they made reassurances that turned out to be completely off the mark. And then what do they do? They turn around and say, well, we do a, what essentially was a cosmetic uh, redrafting of the, um, of the Basel capital rules. And trust us, we've got it right this time. It, it just, it, it, there's a whole series of links in, the, in, the, in this argument. Uh, that in, in, the, in the chain of links, uh, you know, if, if you believe the central bank, uh, let's say their party line, then you have to believe a whole series of things, each of which is completely incre incredible to believe. <laughs> you see. Okay. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that um, your reports are sort of, that they are available on different websites. Have you approached the Bank of England with these and what's the, the mainstream view on, on, your, uh, on your findings? Okay, so we um, occasionally we get a media hit. So my, my stress test reports were published by the Adam Smith Institute and we got, you know, I did a series of them, um, each, you know, each year that we go through the ritual in November or December, the stress test, I'd go through the ritual of saying why I thought it was a lot of rubbish. Um, but the bank, by and large, just ignores critics. It, it, it sort of takes the view that, well, they're a nuisance and we'll just ignore him and he'll go away type of, type of thing. Um, and so, I, you know, I've also got bored with repeating myself over and over again. Um, so this year's nonsense is such and such. Um, so the question, I suppose we have to say that time will tell who is right. Now, the COVID crisis... The Bank of England maintains that it very strongly capitalised banks. I think that's demonstrably false. And that's why I wrote these uh, reports where the evidence is laid out to that effect. Um, time will tell who's right. Uh, my view is that the banks were very weak going into the COVID crisis. And the Bank of England is busy helping to, uh, uh, what's the word, window dress. I could give you specifics um, to essentially... Um, giving them, uh, allowing banks to forbear, which is to say, um, let's fiddle the books uh, in a way that, um, that that kicks the can down the road and let's hope for the best. But I think this is very, very dangerous. Um, if you look at the leverage of the banks, which is the ratio of assets to capital, going into 2007, um, the leverage was about nine. So that's a lot of leverage, and everybody said too much leverage was a big problem. The, the leverage now, in market value terms, is close to 50, you see. So if it was too big then, isn't it a lot bigger now, <laughs> you see? Um, and this is, you know, again, I've got evidence. All we can do is present a criticism and give evidence to back it up. If they won't engage with that, it, it, well, we can try and go to the media, and to some extent we do that. Um, I'll give you another example. With the, with the stress test specifically, um, Steve Baker on Treasury Committee told Mark Carney that um, there was a seminar that I was involved in at the Bank of England on stress tests. And Carney invited Steve to, to, to come along, which he did. And then um, what then happened was the bank were very, very unhappy about what I had to say. And I was ushered out. Uh, as fast as possible. And then Carney later on, okay, so fast forward, let's say nearly a year, uh, and so John Vickers and I went to ITN and we got uh, a little feature on ITN where John, John was interviewed, but I gave the, the, the data. Um, and we, we timed it just before a Treasury Committee meeting, the next, which was to take place the next morning, and we got them off guard. And Connie was there with his, you know, people. And uh, Connie was furious. And he said, uh, why didn't we, he, he criticised Vickers and I for going through the media instead of going to the bank. But conveniently forgetting that I had gone to the bank. And, and, and it was a matter of public record that I had gone to the bank. 
Carney himself invited Stephen, but knew about the seminar. Doubtless he forgot, that doesn't matter. And Vickers had spent years haggling with Carney in the pages of the financial press on whether the banks were capitalized or not and so on. And then Carney kept fobbing him off, you see. So, you know, it's a frustrating game. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it doesn't seem, doesn't look as though things are, are going to change in change much in that respect. But as we're looking at the UK and the world economy, it seems to be a bit of a rough road ahead for a lot of countries, ourselves included. How well do you think the, the, the UK governments and other governments have handled the COVID crisis? I think Sweden's handled it very well. Uh, what Sweden did was essentially um, to treat its uh, citizens as adults who could be um, you know, trusted to do the right thing. Uh, have a, a light, you know, have, by all means, social isolation, social distancing, and so on. Um, I think Sweden could have done a bit better about protecting the more vulnerable, older people. But by and large, Sweden got it right. Um, whereas this country has made a complete pig's ear of it. So, first off, I think the herd immunity theory that initially was put forward was about right. But in any case, you, I don't think you can just lock down the economy forever. Because of, uh, because of the virus. Um, the scientific advice given to um, the government was absolutely appalling. Uh, and it was given by people who were already discredited in terms of their previous work on, let's say, you know, the, the mad cow disease, so forth. So, so we have a huge problem of being at the risk of scientists with, with political agendas who think that it's okay to shut the economy down because they, they come out with scare um, projections, which have been completely way off the mark. So I think there's a weakness in our policy, uh, let's say, regime, a very big problem there that needs to be addressed. I think these scientists should be drummed out of town for this. Um, even if you think only in terms of deaths, you, you have the problem that there have been a lot of, that there's a, let's say, uh, can cancer treatments and, and cancer screenings have been um, put back, so there'll be a lot of deaths from that. You've got mental health problems, suicide, all sorts of misery created um, by the lockdown. Then you've got the fact that the economy has been shut down and a lot of firms, that this has been disastrous for public finances, which are already in a bad way if you look at the, the government's debt to GDP ratio was very, very unhealthy. Um, we have looming pension problems, which again is a like an iceberg coming down the hill at us, and nothing much has been done about that. Um, and um, you have to bear in mind that whilst you could say lock the economy down for a week or two, if you do that for a year, there's a profound damage that's being done that it's you know is is permanent. You look at a lot of small businesses, landlords and so on who, through no fault of their own, are completely destroyed. Um, I think it's been an absolutely awful, um, let's say, policy response. And so I, I think they should reverse the lockdown as soon as possible. I'm very glad to see the kind of, um, let's say, the pushback that's now coming, let's say, from the Red Wall Tories and so on in the north. Um, then the sooner we, 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 we get out of this mindset, the better. One final point I'd make, John, is the purpose of the lockdown was originally only to provide, to, to give uh, the NHS a breathing space so that the NHS was not overwhelmed by all these COVID patients. It never was. But then what you have is a very, very uh, dangerous mission creep where, where the purpose of the lockdown now is kind of evolved into something much more grand and tyrannical. And so a lot of our civil liberties are just trashed like that overnight. I think these are very, very um, dangerous policies. And, and um, I just hope that we get enough of a pushback to, to force the government to reverse itself. But the damage to the Constitution, to civil liberties, basic rights, uh, to see the police go out of control, for instance. You know, the police reputation is rock bottom, must be, for decades over this. So all this sort of damage... Uh, it needs to be addressed up front. But no, we can't do that because we should have a tier three or tier four or tier whatever lockdown. It, it, micromanaged across the country. It makes no sense at all. Sure. 
Yeah, I'm sure. Well, um, we've got a lot of things coming up in the, the, the coming months. Do you think uh, the UK will see any respite from, from this, uh, from Brexit? Well, respite is not the word I would use. <laughs> I mean, the, um, that sounds like the BBC saying, despite Brexit. The economy. I'm a great supporter of Brexit. I, I think um, it would be very good to see the whole process finally ended. Uh, my, my take is that um, Brexit's a wonderful opportunity for the UK. Um, I just hope that in the final, let's say, a few metres in the horse race, the government stands firm on UK sovereignty so that we are not paying taxes to the EU. To the EU. Our fishing rights are restored. Um, we are not in regulatory alignment, which is that the EU tells us what we can and cannot do. Um, but I think Brexit is a fantastic opportunity to, to get rid of like the, um, the shackles of the of, of, of a really appalling regulatory system that's imposed from the EU, which essentially we never had a big say in it anyway. They don't know what they're doing. The EU is going to break up anyway, so we want to be free of it. And I think we have enough problems as it is without making things worse by, um, by unnecessary, let's say, compliance with EU demands. So, you know, I'm still slightly concerned that uh, the government might make concessions to the EU um, which it shouldn't, but I am pleased that, for the most part, Johnson has has told the EU where to go. His biggest mistake was to sign the withdrawal agreement a year or so ago. Now he's trying to wriggle out of it, but I think he should. Um, it, it never made sense in the first place. But that's, you know, you might say a slightly biased point of view. Sure. Well, um, uh, something else that's uh, on the cards coming up shortly, uh, the US election, uh, a lot of financial institutions, they're putting bets on, you know, which way the gold price is going to go. Um, what do you think the longer term effects will be on precious metals if there's going to be, you know, a rumoured run on the US dollar? OK, so I was afraid you were going to ask me who would win the election. <laughs> I think it was Trump, actually, but that's another matter. I don't know. <laughs> um, the, the run on the dollar. Okay, so the dollar, the, the dollar's na- uh, days as a reserve currency are clearly uh, numbered. And so the, um, this, if you like, the dollar standard that we've had since, uh, since the Second World War is clearly, you know, it's not going to last much longer. That means that a lot of those dollars that are floating around outside the United States will end up coming back. Um, I don't think the Federal Reserve has much idea of what to do about this. I could be wrong. Um, I think the deeper question, that is a big question, but a deeper question still is, is where is the fiat currency system going? And so when you look at the kind of commentaries you get on the web, there are some people who, who have like, let's say the fire scenario of a, of hyperinflation, very rapid inflation, and some people have the ice scenario of deflation. So I, 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 I'm inclined to both. I think we're in the ice scenario at the moment, but the money printing that's going on will eventually lead to the fire scenario, a bit like Snowball Earth, you yeah. know, 600 million years ago. There's a lot of ice and then suddenly it all, it all blew up. Um, why I think this is uh, when you see things like, well, not, first off, the massive expansion of central bank balance sheets that we've seen this year, but also when you look at the way the, you know, the, the kind of policy influences that are coming out, and I'm, I'm alluding here to modern monetary theory, which is essentially the, the idea, it's a very extreme form of Keynesianism, which says basically this, that you should, the government should issue a lot of debt and the central bank should print a lot of money and that's it. Um, I think that's a very dangerous, it's a South American solution to, um, to, to, prob- to deep problems and, and that will end up in tears. And so, um, and yet that, that position is getting a lot of airplay. I think it's extremely dangerous. Um, so even if we resist modern monetary theory, the sirens of modern monetary theory, we still got the problem that there's a lot of monetary expansion going on. Um, there are things like helicopter money and QE is still very much there. We still have the fact that 
we don't have an exit strategy in terms of restoring interest. They don't have an exit strategy in terms of restoring interest rates to normal levels. So again, go back to the point about having painted themselves into a corner and then policymakers are becoming ever more desperate. And we're looking at abolishing cash and negative rates. Um, did, you know, everybody on a digital um, central bank currency uh, where we have complete people have complete control over our spending so I think they're just digging deeper and deeper so if, if, if you're going in a direction that's making things wrong I mean, the first thing you should do is think well perhaps if I go back in the other direction we can make things right at least that's the way I would think about it <laughs> well uh, there doesn't seem to be any sign of that so far so for long-term solutions uh, you know you've mentioned modern monetary theory uh, you've spoken about free markets to the bare bones of the economy. If to restart the economy, what would what would you suggest? Well, I would suggest getting rid of lockdown as quickly as possible. Um, I would suggest you, we need a major reform of public finances, tax reform, very high on the agenda. Um, I think we need reform of financial regulation, the reform of central banking. So I I would. Push to well, okay. So, what are the? I would like to push the agenda towards a gold standard or something similar, and away from uncontrolled expansionist discretion on the part of policymakers that who don't know what they're doing. Um, the key to solving the banks is essentially um, to to have tougher capital standards. But underlying that, we need to have much greater liability on the part of people who. Uh, let's say, who make the main decisions in banks. Um, so I'm alluding here also to unlimited liability on the part of uh, banks and potentially shareholders, the different versions of these things. But th these are the, the ways I would go. This is far more radical than anything that we've seen uh, among, from policymakers you know, in, in the crisis. Um, I think we need to dismantle financial regulation but it's not working, it's part of the problem, because basically what happens is that the, reg, um, the industry lobbies the regulators to the point where it controls the regulators, and then the regulators become part of the problem. You see, they're not part of the answer. Um, and um, uh, we see it all over financial regulation. Uh, we see it in, the, for example, box ticking. Uh, so when you look at let's say, in the non-banking side of it, so I look at, for example, insurance, the PRA just ticks boxes. So the, 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 the life insurers lobby the PRA for rules. The PRA gives in to them. And it's all a box-ticking exercise that achieves nothing because the regulators are captured by the, um, by the industry they're meant to regulate. This is a fundamental insight from public choice economics, which tells us basically that regulatory reform that keeps the regulator will never work. But this, unfortunately, is, let's say, um, two way out for, um, for most people. They, people tend to think the regulatory system's failed, so let's fix it. The regulators go along with this because it gives the illusion of the problem being solved. It kicks the can down the road for a few more years until we discover you know, that the old boss is, the new boss is the same as the old boss. It, the, the, the fundamental problems still remain and, and that's the kind of track we've been in for a very long time now so um, so I would get rid of the regulation it doesn't mean that firms can then do anything they want if you make them liable you've, you've, you've brought in the, the incentives for more responsible behavior you know, to get to deal with the banks to social contract and so forth you need an underlying rule of law that says you know the contract should be enforced and so forth and bankruptcy is a key part of that. So if a firm fails, it goes into bankruptcy and so forth. We, we, might, want to, we might want to consider, uh, let's say, how we got our bankruptcy balances right and those sorts of things. But the principle of, of resolving failed institutions via bankruptcy is a very good one, I think. Sure. Well, I think one more question, because it's uh, always a, a hot topic. Um, do you see a, a role for Bitcoin or decentralized cryptocurrency? Um, yeah, but the question is how big the role is. I, I think it certainly has already, let's say, uh, 
a big part, if you pardon the pun, a big part role. But I'm a skeptic. I, I mean, first off, I, I, I'm a great fan of private money in general. Um, but I think some private monies are better than others. Um, Bitcoin has a lot of problems. I think eventually Bitcoin will fail. So the, the price of Bitcoin will be zero. Um, so I'd like to see better um, cryptocurrencies replace Bitcoin. And if they can, if somebody can find a, the, the right kind of formula, then potentially cryptocurrency could have a big role to play. But at the moment, it doesn't. And so I, I sort of sit, sit on the on the sidelines and think, well, I like private money. I like monetary experimentation. I think it should be allowed. But this particular type of experimentation is yet to prove itself. Interesting. Well, I, I, I think it's a good time to end it there. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for your time. We know we know you uh, must be busy with uh, all the work you're doing at the moment. Um, and for giving us uh, an insight into the Austrian school. Um, is there anything you'd like to add before we finish? No, oh, thank you very much, John. It's been good to talk to you. And thank you for uh, your... And in fact, I think just one more question. If uh, we were to uh, ask our customers to read more about Austrian economics, is there anything you'd like to suggest they read? Um, I think the websites are worth visiting. So the Cato Institute in Washington, the IEA in London, the Adam Smith Institute in London, um, the Mises Institute in Auburn is uh, essentially the, uh, let's say, center of Austrian thinking. Um, I could write, I could suggest books. I mean, I'm a great fan of Milton Friedman, of Murray Rothbard, um, Friedrich Hayek, and so on. But most of us these days, we tend to come in on a particular issue, and then we look for blog sites, and there's lots of lovely little essays. So I would I would approach it through the websites rather than books. But if books work for you, then fine, you know. <laughs> sure. Well, again, thank you so much for this interview. It's been great. I'm sure our, our customers will get a lot out of it. Thank you very much, John. Nice Thanks to talk. a lot for your time. Thank you, John. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the Chards channel and keep up to date with our new releases by hitting the notification bell or by following our Instagram, Twitter and Facebook pages.